it's Todd and Todd Cutler and Todd's workshop here. And today we're going to talk about this, a 15th century Central European German style hunting or war crossbow. Now it could be either because it could be low status uh, nobility because it's not that fancy, but it's pretty fancy. So it could be, you know, a higher status soldier, a successful soldier. But what is really critical, it's hard to tell the difference, but what is really critical is that the stock shape is very typical of these kind of bows. And that signals exactly the area that it came from. Now the bow at the front as well is a composite, or in this case, it is a fake composite. We'll come to that in a moment. But it's composite, which these sort of bows very often were, very rarely had a steel bow on them. And it is spanned by this lovely contraption here, because at 650 pounds in draw weight, it needs a Kranequin like this to load it. This is a compound gearbox in here, quite a sophisticated bit of kit. So they started to come in really around about the year 1400, but they were pretty rare until about 1450. And then they just absolutely came into their own and ended up, in fact, being complete artworks in their own right by the time of the 16th and 17th century. Fake bow, what have I done? Well, fake is a nasty word for me. Quite simply that these composite bows in medieval terms are horn and sinew and glue. And they take a great deal of skill and a great deal of time to make. I'm not in a position to do that. So I've taken one of my heavyweight steel bows I've clad it in a lightweight wood and a painted linen cover, which is the sort of thing that they often used to do. But I think the first thing that we need to do is take this down the range. We'll shoot it. I'll show you how the Kranequin works, how that all happens. And then we'll come back and have a look at this old bow. Down on the range now with our late 15th century war bow or hunting bow, it's a bit difficult to tell. But there's a couple of things that you have to do before you put the Kranequin on it. So the first is to swing the bolt clip out of the way. You really often see these broken off in museums because they're quite vulnerable. And the other is that you have to set the nut here into the correct position because at the moment that is in the locked position. So you want to roll it forward because it's the action of the Kranequin coming back that rolls it into position. So I'm going to pull the trigger and just slide it like that. So now a nut is set like that. You now take your Kranequin, put the loop over the stock catches on the pins. The two claws go over the string here at the front. At the beginning, it's easy enough, but as you get towards the end of it, it becomes quite a lot harder to span. Up. And there we are. The trigger is just caught in. You could hear that, I hope. Now, take the pressure off. Kranequin comes away. Pop your bolt clip in first of all. And then the butt of the bolt goes under. Nice, just above the bullseye. And then we're ready to go again. So the nut here, just pop it into that position. So we're back there again, bolt clips out the way, and we'll span it again. And I'll show you something quite interesting. Oh, ah, gets me every time. If you're a soldier, you do it yourself, but if you're the Lord of the Manor, in the meantime, while you're taking your shot, you've had some servant who's unwound this for you. Now, while I'm winding this one up, I'll show you something interesting about a Kranequin. It's got a ratchet in it, it must have, because look, it's not unwinding, but it hasn't. It has straight gears. So why is it not unwinding? Well, it's to do with the teeth and the way they're profiled, but I'll show you that when I pop it open later on. But often on these kind of bows, they have a more complex trigger system. And when it's fully spanned, you have to set the trigger. And to do that, you have to let go of the Kranequin. So this is a really important feature. And again, this is why I like the goat foot bows. Makes life a lot easier. And there we have it. Let's go and have a look what we got. Well, that's 25 meters, not my best shooting, but it really is into target. Back at base now. And as you can see, this bow shoots really nicely, but the Kranequin is slightly awkward to use. However, it does have some really good advantages over other systems for the German way of, of fighting wars, because they seem to love shooting crossbows either from horseback as part of pitched battles, but I doubt that, but more of skirmishing, I'm guessing, but you see it a lot in the artwork. Now, a goat's foot lever, that has a limitation to the power that you can use to span it, especially if you're sitting down on horseback. A windlass, that'd be a complete nightmare looking after the ropes. But a Kranequin allows you to do that, to span really heavy bows sitting in horseback, even if it is slightly awkward. It answers that problem. 
Now, is this a war bow or is this a hunting bow? Well, the artwork, the design was done by the client, so we can't go down that route. But this sort of intermediate level of decoration where it's not super fancy and then screams nobility, and it's not super plain and therefore is military, could be either way. So it could be a well-to-do soldier or a lower-born noble. But either way, you're going to want a dagger to go with it. And Todd Cutler comes into its own for that. These two rondel daggers here, military, civilian. So I'll show you these. This first rondel dagger here, a nice short blade, hollow ground and stout. Exactly the sort of rondel dagger that you see in the manuscripts nobility wearing all the time. Hollow rondels, you don't want this thing too heavy. Nice bit of decoration, barley twist handle. Absolutely perfect if you think that's a nobleman's bow. This second rondel is far more military. Based on one in the Rothenberg collection, so absolutely suited to a military version of that bow. A long blade to get to all the soft bits, nice big rondels to protect your hand, and a studded grip. You will not let go of this one. Well, the sales pitch is over now, so we'll carry on with the bow. But seriously, visiting toddcutler.com or buying the t-shirts really helps support the channel. So this bow here, we'll go to the front of it. We have the stirrup. Now that is not a stirrup for your foot. It's for holding it on this kind of a bow with a Cranoquin bow. You will never manage to span this by hand. And that one has been blacked with heat and linseed oil. Then at the front, we've got a nice woven leather binding, just decoration, no structural purpose at all. Linen, uh, sorry, hemp bindings here, linen string, nice painted bow on there. You want to paint or, or cover in snakeskin or birch bark or something, any kind of a composite bow historically, because they would absorb moisture. And, you know, that's no good for the bow at all. The stock itself is cherry and it's covered in horn and bone. And in this case, with some scrimshaw work on it. And again, a nice blacked trigger. There's a couple of other features I'd like to show. So we have a cord binding here, it holds the nut in place. That really is to hold the nut in place. It's not to resist the power of the bow itself. That's done by the shape of the socket. So that just stops the nut spinning out when it's shot. You have a bolt clip. Swing it out of the way for when you're spanning it with the Cranoquin. And then a little steel disc here that's just set in the top. Most Cranoquin bows have something like that, some sort of a metal plate on top. And that really is just, it, it's the heel of the Cranoquin is touching down on here. Otherwise it'd end up shredding the bow and the horn in the end. So that's it really for the bow. What I'm gonna do now, is just pop the Cranoquin open. We'll have a look at the inside. Taking Cranoquin apart is really straightforward. In this case, it's just a series of pins. So I just tap them out and pull them out with pliers. So it's the handle off. So let's open this box up here. So top strap off, lid. And then we have a four tooth pinion gear here for the crank. Four tooth is weird. People don't do that nowadays, but in this particular application, it's perfect. But even weirder than that, we'll get the main drive gear out. We have a three tooth pinion here. Again, anyone who's involved in gearing, that's just not something you do. The rest of you are going, well, what's the fuss about that? Well, it's important because what it means is that as the bow, as you load it, tries to pull that open, pull that rack down. It's got to try and turn a three tooth gear and it can't do it. It doesn't like doing it. And it's the force of you turning it from the handle end that allows this whole system to operate. As soon as you let go of the handle, it just self locks, which if it was a better gearing, if that was a six tooth gear, it would just spin around and break your hand, but it's not. And that's the genius of this thing. Deliberate, accidental, I don't know, but they hit on something really clever for this. But anyway, that's the end of our 15th century hunting war crossbow. I hope you like it. I'll see you again. Um.